You may have noticed on your bulletin that uh, I have a information about the case for Christ. Has anyone seen that? Is it good? It's good. Okay. That's what I heard, and I took a chance and went ahead and put it in here. It is playing in Brenham at 2.30 and at 9. But that might be 9.30 because I remember the 9. I don't remember what was the 30, so you might check it if you're going to the late one. So... Anyway, and we have fun, uh, Friday fun night this Friday, and won't you come and bring a f- friend? We're having more and more folks come, and the more the merrier, so you don't have to go to this church in order to enjoy it. Just bring anyone you'd like, <coughs> and there'll be food, fun, and fellowship. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, Before we begin, I wanted to do something. I'm going to put something on the board, on the screen. Y'all recognize those people? (laughs) Congratulations to Keith and Elizabeth. I think it was last last Sunday. Was it the 15th? uh, April the 15th? Y'all? Oh, Saturday. Okay. And that was your uh, 15th uh, wedding anniversary. But I say 15th. <laughs> Did y'all celebrate your 15th? <laughs> 70th, I don't know. That was four months and five days before I was born. So that was a good year, wasn't it? Anyway, yeah, go ahead. Thanks for showing us how it's done. We just, (coughs) excuse me, we love y'all so much and are so glad that y'all are part of our church family, that you decided to join us, and you know, Keith looks pretty mean there, he's kind (laughs) of, he's he's thin, he's lean and mean in that picture, and Elizabeth is just beautiful as always, so anyway, I thought I'd give us that before we get started. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. The grass withers and the flower flades, but the word of the Lord stands forever. Let's prepare ourselves in our usual fashion. We'll have a few moments of silent prayer, and during that time we have the opportunity to name privately to God the Father any unconfessed sins which ensures the filling of the Holy Spirit. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your mighty word and revealing the things that otherwise we would have no idea. The beginning, Genesis, the first man, the first woman, how we got into this situation and how we're going to get out. We're just so thankful that we have the privilege and honor of being here as a royal family of God, focusing on your word, growing in grace and knowledge. And we pray that you will help us to concentrate, for we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Last Sunday was Resurrection Sunday, and I had the whole service pretty much was dedicated to evidence. We don't believe in Jesus Christ. We don't believe in the resurrection with a blind faith, which is called fideism, if you remember. But it is all based on evidence. Now, when I was giving you the evidence for the Bible, there was one item I left out. So I went ahead and made a PowerPoint I'll put it up on the board, that has to do with evidence, evidence of the resurrection, but the first item in evidence for the resurrection is the written evidence, which is the Bible. We see that in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 3 through 4. The only problem is, is when you use the Bible as written evidence, there are people who are skeptical, (laughs) skeptical. Skeptical. Anyway, they don't believe it. So we have to be ready to 
give them a reason, give them evidence that they can put their trust in the Bible, and that's what we have following this. First of all, there is fulfilled prophecy. There's no other book like the Bible that has hundreds and hundreds of detailed, specific prophecies that have already been feel, fit, uh, fulfilled. That's a very powerful, powerful uh, evidence because only God knows the future and he declares it in his word. We also have scientific facts stated long before man discovered them. The earth is round, doesn't hang on anything. The fact that um, the second law of thermodynamics is stated in the Bible on and on. I think in my uh, study on the Bible profile, there, I think I have about 18 or 20 of them listed, and there's more than that. <coughs> we also have textual evidence. Thousands of ancient manuscripts. Now, the original <coughs> epistles, letters, and writings were, of course, worn out, but there are more copies which are called manuscripts, far more than any other ancient literature. For instance, you have the Iliad and the uh, Odyssey, and you have other ancient writings, and I think most of them have, I think those are somewhere around 69 copies. Uh, some of them only have one copy, and they were uh, copied sometimes hundreds of years after the original, after the, I guess it was given by word of mouth, I don't know. But anyway, the uh, evidence, textual evidence of the Bible within 20 some odd years after um, the originals were written, we already started getting, we have copies of those. We have over 5,600 copies of manuscripts. And what that does is help us to take the manuscripts and look at our Bibles and we see how close they are. So some people would say that the Bible has been essentially polluted over the years uh, because it was in a different language, it has to be interpreted, and all the other things, but God has made sure that his word has remained pure, inerrant, and plenary, meaning it covers everything we need. It also has seamless continuity. 66 books read as one. Sometimes I think when we witness to people and we're going to use the Bible, instead of calling it a book, maybe we should call it only Christianity has a whole library, 66 books. And part of the proof that it is the revealed Word of God is that it is completely seamless. That what, what I'm talking about, you had around 40 maybe 44 writers that lived in different places, uh, and I'm talking about different countries. They were of different background. There were kings, there were fishermen, there were uh, farmers, there were all types, and they, were, and they spoke different languages. Now, can you imagine getting 66 books with all that, with all those differences, and that when you read it, it doesn't matter whether you're reading in Genesis, in fact, we can go to Genesis and then go all the way back to Revelation and they corroborate each other. They are, it's amazing how you can go all over the Bible. It doesn't contradict itself. It demonstrates that it is, came from the hand of God. We also have archaeology. That's the one I left out, by the way. Archaeology is phenomenal in substantiating, verifying the Bible it verifies biblical places, people, and events. So if the Bible was not true, then the, the more earth they turn over in digging for uh, artifacts would demonstrate that it's not true. But you can go today into the Middle East and you can go to the places where the Bible says a particular city is, and most of the time it's even still named that same, that same city, the same location. 
There was a time when they said that the Hittite people was a figment of imagination of Christians until they, un, until they dug down deep enough wherever it was and they found that the Hittite empire was, not only existed, but it flourished big time. So those are the evidences that we have as far as the resurrection is concerned because we have written evidence in the Bible. And again, we have fulfilled prophecy, scientific facts, Textual evidence, seamless continuity, and archaeology. All those are very strong arguments. Any reasonable person would recognize the validity of them. We also have a verbal testimony in Luke chapter 24, verse 5b through 26. This is where actually it was an angel who spoke to the women who had gone to the tomb testifying verbally that Jesus Christ had, had risen. He was not there. There's so many other proofs, but I'll just mention one. One reason you can be, be certain that the Bible was inspired by God, it wasn't just made up by men, because on resurrection morning, it was only the women that had the courage and the fortitude to go down there and check it out. To go, of course, they were going to um, see if they could uh, attend Jesus, his body. But the men were back home hiding. And the women, there were the ones, it was women that, were the, uh, that was uh, introduced to Jesus Christ in his resurrection body first, not the men. The Jewish men would never put it that way. They would never, uh, they would be going to the, to the, <laughs> to the tomb first. Also, eyewitnesses. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 5 through 6. I'm not going into this in de detail because we went over it in detail last Sunday, but at least you have some uh, scriptures to verify this. In any court case, if you have an eyewitness, it's probably one of the most powerful testimonies as to the truth of something. And there were many eyewitnesses to the resurrected Christ. Of course, all of his di disciples, and there was other, in fact, in one place, and the verse that I'm giving you here, 1 Corinthians 15, 5 through 6, over five, 500 saw him at the same time. And you know what the skeptics say about that verse? They say, oh, well, they were all hallucinating. <laughs> 500 people at the same time were hallucinating. That's the best they can come up with. The empty tomb. The empty tomb Concrete evidence, or maybe I should say stone <laughs> evidence. Even the enemies of Christ, no one would dispute the fact that the tomb was empty. And the best they could come up with is they paid the soldiers who were guarding the tomb to go along with their cockamamie story that what happened was the soldiers went to sleep. This is what they alleged. The soldiers went to sleep and someone came in while they were asleep and stole the body. And the soldiers can testify to it while they're asleep. You see? How would they know if anybody stole the body, body if they were sleeping? But that's the best excuse they could come up with. Pretty pathetic. And there's also extra biblical records in, in Jewish antiquities, 18.3.3 and there are others as well. I've just given you one. So if somebody would say, well, yeah, but uh, this is all Bible made up stuff. Well, there were historians of the day, unbelievers that, made the, uh, that gave the account of what was true. So I thought I would give you that, and we'll send that to you on an email if you want it. It will be on the website, but it'll take, uh, take a little while. By the way, the, the website is a little bit behind because they are... Uh, rebuilding our website right now. It's going to take, I think, about two months is what they said. It's a long process. It's over 20 years old, and they had, did everything by code back then, and it's even gotten to the point to where we're losing uh, data on the website. I, I noticed that we, I went to the home page and clicked on the uh, Promises booklet, and it wouldn't come up. But it did come up in Spanish. I don't know why, so anyhow. Okay, uh, I know some of y'all are still writing, but I can't linger here. Um, 
you can get this again we will send it to you on an email if you're on our email list and it will also be on the website okay turn in your bibles to genesis chapter 3 I'll put this on the board as well. Genesis chapter 3 verse 13 is where we're going to pick it up today. If you're a serious student of the word, Genesis 3, uh, chapter 3 is hard to get through. Because it shows man and the woman in disgusting realism you read that and you just get disgusted at all that God had done for them perfect bodies perfect environment gave them everything they could ever want they would live forever if they did not disobey one command and that was to eat of the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil they would go in, on walks with him in the cool of the evening. Their creator, their maker, that loved them so much, he did all of this, and then he would share with them things that were so marvelous. Uh, they had to be just enraptured when they were walking in him in a perfect environment, in perfect bodies, and hearing things that would so satisfy their soul. And it could have been that way forever. But God did give them volition. He gave them free will to decide. They could either choose to stay in that wonderful state or they could choose to act independently of him, rebel against him, and believe the lie of the serpent whom Satan was using in order to deceive the woman. That's just the beginning of it. That's sad enough. But as you go through, and we already have, we've seen the, the woman being uh, tempted. The man appears to be at her side. He didn't protect her. He didn't tell the serpent to get lost. There's many things that he could have done, and yet... She went ahead and ate of the, uh, of the uh, fruit, and then... She handed it to him, enticing him to do the same. And what's even worse is that he was tempted, but he wasn't deceived. He knew full well the consequences, and he put his wife above the Lord. Little did they know the tremendous consequences that would come of this. There would be consequences in the zoological realm. The animals would change. The botanical realm, the plants, all the vegetation would change. And also, anthropological change. They themselves would change. Now, the good news is that it's not a permanent change. That change certainly is lasting a long time. If you don't believe it, go out and try to make a garden from scratch. You'll see what I'm talking about. So that all is sad enough. But then when the Lord God came walking in the garden and he called out for Adam... Where are you, Adam? Now, of course he knew where Adam was. It wasn't, he, 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 the location was a mystery to God. He knew exactly where he was. He was back there probably crouched behind some fig tree that he made clothes out of and was afraid. Now think of that, how bad that, first time. That's one of the many things that happened. For the first time, Adam had fear. And worst of all, he was fearing the God that loved him beyond measure. And when Adam did respond, he said something that was 
somewhat subtle that you might miss in dodging the accountability that he should have owned up to. He said, well, I was naked so I hid from you. Before he ate of the fruit, he was naked, but I don't know if there was even, even any word for naked. I mean, they didn't think they were naked. There was no such thing as clothes. There were only two people, him and his wife. They were in their birthday suit the way that they were created, and there was nothing wrong about it. There was nothing strange, odd, embarrassing, or anything. And when he said that, rather than saying and owning up, saying, I disobeyed you, I ate of the forbidden fruit, and now that's all I can do is acknowledge it. That would have been great. That would have been honorable. But no, essentially he's blaming God even in this first statement. Because who is it that made him naked? God did. And so he's saying, well, I'm naked, and I, now I can't stand before you naked, so I hid. In a way, it's blaming God. And, God, and, and of course, God said, who told you that you were naked? And then he knew he's had. He knew what was going down. And the only thing that in his mind he could do, rather than owning up to the truth, and, oh, by the way, and God also said, he said, who told you was na you were naked? And then he said, have you eaten of the forbidden fruit? And I imagine Adam's heart just sunk at that time. He knew that God knew. But God did it in a, in a loving way so that he gave Adam the opportunity to acknowledge his sin. That's all he had to do was be humble and say, I, I did it. But instead, he did the most hard thing. Rather than protecting his wife, he betrayed her and said, it was the woman. And by the way, the woman that you gave me. So it's the woman's fault and it's God's fault, but it's not Adam's fault. He would not take the blame. And that's so, so like us. The reason it's hard to take is because when we're looking at these pathetic excuses... And rather than being honest and honorable, we're seeing ourselves, aren't we? That's what we're all prone to do, is hide, cover up, lie. Try to do anything rather than take responsibility. And then you know what happened. Or do you know what happened? Let's go up here. I have this in smaller font. Now he said to the woman... He said, this is what Adam said. The woman who you gave me, she gave me from the tree and I ate. Now, this is where we're picking up the narrative today, and I'm making it in big font to make sure that you can see it and to make sure you can't read ahead. Or not very far anyway. So then the Lord's attention, the Lord God said to the woman, what is this you have done? Now, again, notice every time, what is he, what is he leading with? Questions. And now he's giving her the opportunity to come clean. I'm the one. I, I was there. I, I, I ate it. There's no excuse for it, but I did it. That would be the honorable thing. What does she do? We're in full bloom, operation past the buck here. And the woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. That's not my fault. I'm, I'm just a woman. He deceived me. I had no defense against this. It's really the serpent's fault. And I ate. Now notice God also addressed the woman by asking her a question. He gave her an opportunity to take responsibility for her sin by acknowledging it to him, but she did not. Unfortunately, the woman demonstrated that she had no more character or courage than Adam. She too decided to avoid accountability by passing the buck. We all seem to be born experts at pointing the finger at someone else to take the blame. Don't we? Are you going to take that? Are you going to acknowledge that? It's true, and you know it's true. She could have redeemed herself a bit from eating of the forbidden fruit, which she had already done, and the enticing Adam to eat it as well, by urging her... Uh, should be just her, him. Let me get rid of that. 
if it's not going to. We're talking about urging Adam. There you go. Uh, she could redeem herself to some extent by urging him, that'd be Adam, to be honest with the Lord by acknowledging his sin, but she obviously did not. She chose instead to excuse herself by blaming the serpent. So what I'm saying, when they were back there, they were hiding from God. That must have been a long period of time in their mind. It would be kind of like if you had parents that were strict disciplinaries, strict disciplinarians, and I know uh, Carrie tells me that her daddy did this. Fortunately, mine didn't, but hers did. He told her she had uh, done something. She misbehaved somehow. And he said, it was in the morning, and he says, I'm going to go to work, but when I get home this evening, I'm going to spank you. If, go ahead, do it now. Get it over with. You know, we see the longest day is talking about the uh, uh, attack, uh, in, uh, you know, when we storm the beaches uh, in order to uh, take over, uh, take back uh, Europe. They call it the longest day. That was the longest day for her, I'm sure. She, what do you think she was thinking about all day long? Well, she told me she had a strategy. She, w she decided she was going to take some pillows and put in, you know, these little throw pillows and put behind her. None of that worked. But anyway, my whole point is that's probably what it was like for them. And this is the saddest, saddest part. Is that while they were doing, their, doing that, they were afraid, conniving and trying to desperately figure out how they were going to get out of this. They they lost their confidence of how much the Lord loved them. And that's extremely sad. He had demonstrated in every single way that there was not a chink, a fault, a crack, nothing in his phenomenal, perfect love for them. And yet, they forgot about that and acted as if uh, he was going to be unreasonable. <coughs> No one can be forgiven or learn from their transgressions as long as they make excuses for them. In fact, I have that on a PowerPoint. I'll show it to you. Two things I was going to show you. This is the, if I can get this up here and get it right. Is it up there on the deal yet? Okay, there's two things I wanted to show you, and it's, uh, it's important enough to put it on the PowerPoint for you. This is, has to do with what I had covered earlier about trying to avoid accountability. When sinners humble themselves and acknowledge their sin, they receive forgiveness. When they don't, they suffer judgment. That is a, that is a, a clear case throughout history. And now, this is what we just had, but now I have it on PowerPoint. No one can be forgiven or learn from their transgression as long as they make excuses for themselves. Teenagers, are you listening? Of course, we all do it, but teenagers seem to be very adept at it. Okay. Okay. I just wanted you to see that again. When sinners humble themselves and acknowledge their sin, they receive forgiveness. When they don't, they suffer judgment. No one, be, no one can be forgiven or learn <clears throat> from their transgressions, from their sins, from their wrongdoing, as long as they make excuses for themselves. Now, I mentioned teenagers, and I don't know if I know there's some teenagers listening because there's a few here and if they get angry with me then that's okay they need to learn to be humble because that's what the Bible does to us if you are open and you're eager to learn about God then he is revealing himself to us that when we misbehave when we sin when we have have offended him and others then we need to own up to it very important principle
Once we take responsibility for our sin by admitting it to God and the one that was hurt by it, healing and restoration can begin. The reason why this is often hard to do is because arrogance gets in the way. Every one of us, because we are human, are infected with the arrogance monster. The most sweetest person that ever lived had a monster living inside them, and it's called arrogance, and we all have it. And the only way to be right with God is to acknowledge that sin and how arrogant we are. Now, what she said was true. She said the serpent deceived her. Now, that was true, but that did not absolve her of being culpable for distrusting and disobeying God. It was an excuse, but it really wasn't an excuse. It was an excuse that only made things worse. When we yield to temptation, pointing to the tempter does not remove our guilt. When you sin, you can't say, yeah, but. The last two words you want to do when you sin, and you're going to, whether you're talking to someone else or whether you're talking to God, there should be no yeah, buts. All of your toes should be hurting now because mine are. The American people usually forgive those in Hollywood and in Washington who have misbehaved and then admitted it. But, they have, but they've been much harder on those who have tried to cover up their offenses. They see the cover-ups as being worse than the original transgressions, and you know that that's true, don't you? And it's the same with us. Humility is very attractive when you have done something wrong or been offensive when you've sinned in some fashion. But we have this thing where we always like to cover up. Now, <clears throat> think for a moment what the first man and the first woman's obedience against God cost them. I have seven things, maybe eight things here, to give you an idea of how traumatic this was. Number one, they lost their wonderful relationship with their Lord who made them. That's the worst right off the bat. They had this wonderful relationship with the Lord. We can't even measure the love and, the, and how wonderful everything was because we live in a fallen world. They were not. Number two, they lost their confidence in the Lord's love for them. That's what I was describing a moment ago. We should never, ever doubt in the slightest how much God loves us. He loves every one of us to a measure and to a degree that we can't even conceive. You see, God can never love you more than he always loves you because he always loves you at the max. Now, in, in our realm, in the, in the human realm, we, for instance, when you get married, usually or hopefully there's a lot of love going on there. There's probably a lot of love and a lot of love making, and that's good because that's the way God designed it. But sometimes that love kind of starts to wane a bit once you start seeing the fleet of clay of your spouse. You still love him. Or maybe we, some people will say, yeah, I, I love him, but I don't like him. What they really mean is I, really, I love him, but I don't like him right now. And if we were honest, we would say that. But see, God's not like that. God could never say that, well, I love my children, but I just don't love them right now, or I don't like them right now. God's love is so, we can always depend on it. And that can change your life if you just dwell on that. Because God's not out trying to find something that you do, some fault, something bad, and now, now he's going to zap you. It's just the opposite. He gave his own son, Jesus Christ, to redeem you from that. That's the most any, any person could do. And that love, if he did that while you were a sinner, what kind of love must he have for you now as his child? Number three, innocence was replaced with shame, guilt, fear, deception, pain. None of those things even existed until after they ate of the fruit and disobeyed God. That had to come as a shock. What is, 
What is, what is shame? They never felt shame before. That's why the Bible makes sure that it says in Genesis chapter 2, verse 25, that they were naked and they were not ashamed. There was no such thing as shame or embarrassment. How could it be when everything's perfect? And then the guilt. Oh, wow, the guilt had to be crushing. And then they had fear. Then they got into deception. And then there was pain. That's, we're going to see that was part of the judgment of the woman, was pain. And I'm so glad I'm a man. Number four, a once happy marriage would witness betrayal, uncertainty, and competition for leadership. Can you see how immense each one of these points are? That happened, boom, right away. They experienced it. Number five, once imperishable, perfect bodies began slowly to decay and die. I don't know how, they, how long they lived before they ate of the fruit and that decaying process started. But yeah, it's like they're young, vigorous. They were at the height of their youth, always. They never got old. I don't know if they got tired. Maybe they did. I, maybe, I, I don't know. But if they did, it would take a lot. What did, what did the woman do the first time she saw a wrinkle? I guess she would look in the water or she'd look on her hand. Woo, what, look at that. I mean, they didn't have all that um, oil of Olay. Is that one of them, the cream? <laughs> it's the only one I can think of. One of many. One of many. Okay, well, it's the only one I know of. There was no olive oil, so she couldn't do anything with it there. So, and to know that they're going to die. And then after well, however long they were seeing each other perfect. By the way, that had to be a bit of an adjustment for the other partner, wouldn't it? The, the other spouse? I guess Adam, when he saw his wife and she started getting wrinkles, maybe she started getting gray hair or something. That would be a challenge. Would he be wise enough to keep his mouth shut? <laughs> if he didn't, certainly that would bring on more grief. Number six. They were, that should be forced, they were forced out of their beautiful, bountiful garden to live among thorns and thistles. The perfect, beautiful environment, all the colors, the flowers, the trees, the sparkling water, all that was now Brown, hard earth, thorns, thistles. I've got a beautiful picture of that that I'm not going to show you until I get to the scripture where they were forced out of the garden. But it, it perfectly depicts that. Their free supply of delicious food ended and their struggle to grow food began. Now to us, that's not any big deal. I, I imagine there are people and probably a lot of youngsters they never had a garden. They never had to get out in the ground and hold the ground and then uh, plant the seeds and then see it grow and constantly picking weeds. They, and, and by the way, getting chiggers all, all the while. They don't know about that, but this is a big deal. All we do is go to the grocery store. In fact, some of us, we don't even have to do that. All you got to do is get online or call somebody. They'll haul it to you. But they had to start from scratch in thorns and thistles and probably black gumbo. You all know what that is. And go out there and start scratching in the ground and ha have some food when it was all wonderfully provided by the Lord. And then number eight, they'd have to wear clothes that wore out and would have to be replaced. I know we all, we are creatures that are clothed from the moment we're born. They throw a diaper on you or wrap you in or something. And throughout our life, we have clothes. And it's not that hard for us when, you have, when your clothes wear out or you outgrow them or whatever it is. You just go down and buy some more. They had to make their clothes. And at first, they, the only clothing they had was from animal skins. Well, I take that back. The first clothes they had was their ridiculous fig suits. Big leave suits. Anyway, that was a pro these are just some of the things that happened. There's going to be more, but I thought that was enough to give you the gravity of the situation. Now, verse 14, Genesis 3, 14. 
And the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you. And the AV, authorized version, in the margin, has, says it means from among, instead of uh, cursed are you from among uh, all the cattle and so forth. But it says, cursed are you more than all cattle and more than every beast of the field. And on your belly you shall go, and dust shall you eat all the days of your life. Now let's see, there's a lot of information about this verse. God did not ask any questions of the serpent as he did Adam and Eve. The serpent is judged as being a tool of the evil one, which is Satan. He didn't have to ask him any questions. We don't know what the form of the serpent is. Before Satan, what it was, uh, before Satan used it to deceive the woman. But we know it didn't crawl on his butt, betty, uh, belly and it didn't eat dust. As that was part of the cursing that came from God. So what God did when he cursed him changed this serpent from what he was. For all we know, he might have walked upright. Or maybe he was on all four. I don't know what it was, but he was probably... A creature, an animal, whatever you might characterize him as, as being maybe even beautiful. Something that you wouldn't mind dis dis having a discussion with. I don't think it was a slimy snake, a slithering, slimy snake, that the woman would have been that interested in talking to him. I know I wouldn't. There is... I don't know about you, I won't ask for a show of hands, but I think probably most people here are not all that fond of snakes. If God would have said, I'm not making snakes, period, I would have said, hallelujah, and life would have been better. Uh, where was it? Is it in Australia? No, where is it that they're supposed to not have any snakes? Not Australia. Ireland. Where? Ireland. Hawaii. 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 Okay, well... Just in time, they'll get... I heard that one time a snake got up in the... Um, where the uh, wheels go up into the plane, and when it landed, it got out, and it got in there and infected and, you know, started his deal. So I don't know if that's true. So there's, there's, there was certainly a difference in this creature, a big difference. It says dust... Uh, <coughs> excuse me. By the way... Uh, anything that crawled on its belly was considered unclean in, uh, by the Hebrews. And you see that in Le uh, Leviticus, Leviticus 11, verse 42. Unclean animal. Who'd want to eat a snake anyway? I guess if you are hungry enough. Now, this phrase, the dust you shall eat, this phrase may be a metaphor in the Bible to refer to defeat and shame. It was used this way when referring to the nations who have mistreated the Jews as if they were mongrels. Now, what we're talking about, I'm going to give you an, an illustration of the, this dust-eating thing. But throughout history, the Jews have been kicked around, abused, anti-Semitism, and treated like mongrels, like dogs. That's the way it has been. That's the way it is now. And that's the way it's going to be until Jesus Christ returns and then it's going to be the other way around. The Jews won't treat the other, the Gentiles, the nations in that fashion. But the Gentile nations are going to honor and even pay tribute to Israel. And if they refuse to do it, God will just simply cut off their reign. That's R-A-I-N, that is. And that's scriptural, by the way. So, those people who do, have been mistreating the Jews will be humbled by the Lord when he sets up his kingdom, <clears throat> and they will pay proper respect to Jews who are God's chosen people. Here's one of the verses. I have two of them. The first one is Isaiah 49, 23. And kings will be your guardians, and their princes your nurses. What this is saying is it's addressing the... Israelites, addressing the Jewish people. And when 
Jesus Christ returns, he's going to say, he's saying the kings of the nations, instead of abusing you, will be guarding you. And their princes will be your nurses. They're going to take care of you. Then it says, I have it in red here, they will bow down to you with their faces to the earth and lick the dust off your feet. Again, this is a sign <clears throat> excuse me, of degradation. And you will know that I am the Lord. And in that same context, we have this verse. Micah chapter 7, verse 17. The, the, the nations, now they're going to be uh, licking the dust when it refers to the Jews instead of uh, abusing them. Micah 7, 17. They will lick the dust like a serpent, like reptiles of the earth. They will come trembling out of their fortresses to the Lord our God. They will come in dread and they will be afraid before thee, before the Jewish people. That's what's going to happen. And you have all this, this dust eating or dust licking going along with it. It's, it's a subordination. It is a uh, degrading. Now, I don't think that it meant literally that this beast that was going to be cursed in this fashion, actually his diet was dirt or dust. I don't think any animal can live on dust or dirt. Now, when they slither along and they open up their mouth and that old farked tongue comes out, they'll, uh, they might get some dust in their mouth and that's okay with me. But I don't think that they are going to, uh, that they actually depend on that as a diet. Now, the word cursed is only used in addressing the serpent as the originator of the temptation in reference to the ground. The ground is also cursed, as we will see, as the sphere of man's penalty. The, 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 uh, God cursing the uh, ground is in verse 17. Jehovah does not pronounce a curse either upon the man or the woman. And so what we're going to see is that the, ser the serpent was cursed... And in doing that, because Satan was essentially using the serpent to deceive, Satan is cursed and the earth is cursed, but the woman and the man were not cursed. They were judged, but they were not cursed. There's a difference. Not only was the serpent going to eat dust, he was, what does it say? It says, you shall eat all the days of thy life. You shall eat dust their entire life. The curse wasn't only on this specific creature, but upon all serpents, and it will last even into the millennium. That's how strong this curse was by God. In Isaiah 65, 25, it says, The wolf and the lamb shall graze together. This is talking about the, big, the um, zoolog zoological change that will take place place in the millennium. The animals, as they are fierce and uh, vociferous, uh, 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 what is the word with the, uh, with the canines? Carnivorous. carnivorous. Yeah, thank you. Uh, they're carnivorous now. That's going to change when Jesus Christ returns. You see, I told you that all this, fortunately, that took place because of what the first man and the first woman did, it's going to last a long time, but it's not permanent. By the time you get to the millennium, everything is going to revert back. It's going to be perfect environment again. The animals will lose their ferocity. And you have the wolf and the lamb shall, gaze, uh, shall graze together. Right now, the lamb is the lunch for the wolf. And the lion shall eat straw like an ox. Now, isn't that going to be strange? The zookeepers that love that, can you imagine how much it costs to feed these big 800-pound lion and all the food? Just give him some hay. And dust shall be the serpent's food. This is in the millennium. So when it says all the days, all you, you shall eat, all the days of thy life, talking about eating dust, that will carry right in into the millennium. They shall do no evil or harm in all my holy mountains, says the Lord. Isn't that going to be wonderful during the millennium? Of course, the millennium, we, we were singing this morning, 
Jesus is coming again. What were y'all thinking about? Were y'all thinking about the rapture or the millennium? Rapture, right? If you were thinking about the second advent and the millennium, see me afterwards, okay? I'm not going to fuss, just inform. The serpent was the craftiest of all the animals. We see that in Genesis chapter 3, verse 1. But he wasn't wise enough to avoid the crushing curse that he received from God. And that's the way with all so many creatures that think they are so smart. And they are so wise. And they are so crafty. All they do is dig in deeper and they're going to get it. The serpent was cursed. And the plan of salvation was given because, <clears throat> excuse me, the plan of salvation belongs only to man and woman. The serpent and Satan are not involved in the plan of salvation. Now, the reason I'm saying that is because we're, when I hit this next, when I go down, you're going to see the next scripture that we were only, be, maybe I can read it, but maybe not much more than that. It's Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, and it's one of the most important scriptures in the Bible. And I'm setting it up for you already by saying this. The serpent, Satan, and the land was cursed, but the man and woman was not cursed because they're part of the plan of salvation. They're included in God's redemption plan. The serpent... And Satan and the earth is not, well, the earth is to a degree, it's going to change at the millennium. So here we go. Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. Huge verse. And I filled in, I filled in some blanks here so that you can, if you have your Bible there, you can write them in the margin or put them somewhere because this might be a little hard to understand what all is going on here without these little Words in the brackets here. First, I'm going to read it without reading anything in brackets, and then I'll go back. Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise you on the head, and you shall bruise him on the heel. A lot of people might read that and say, what's the big deal about that? Don't even know what it's talking about. Well, let's go through it again and look at it. Let's fill in the blanks this time. And I, God, God is the one in charge, will put enmity between you. Now, he's talking, I have servant slash Satan. He's act, in, in this scripture, he just cursed the serpent, and it sounds like he's meaning this for the serpent, but he's also including Satan, as we will see, because Satan used this serpent, this creature, to deceive and tempt the first parents. Now put enmity between you, serp the serpent and Satan, and the woman, that would be, well, who, who will soon be called Eve, when we get to that in the text, she's still just called the woman, and between your seed, and it's talking about Satan's seed, and Satan's seed is unregenerate mankind, unregenerate mankind are unbelievers, and her seed, that is the woman's seed, which is Jesus Christ. He, Jesus, shall bruise you, Satan, on the head, and you, Satan, shall bruise him, Jesus Christ, on the heel. Now, I fill in the blanks, and some of you might be thinking, well, great, still, I don't know what the heck is going on here. But we're going to, what time, I have to, the glare is on the clock. Oh, well, according to that, this, well, a time has passed. But at least you have this. I've read it to you. And what you might do, what would be a good exercise is between now and next Sunday is to see how much you can put together out of that. See if you can be able to explain what this is talking about in your own words to someone who doesn't, has never heard it before. Maybe even to an unbeliever that is totally uninitiated in the Gospels, Scriptures. And see what you can come up with. Because there's a lot here. I will tell you this. This much. This is one of the most 
important passages in the Bible because it is the first declaration of the gospel. And it is what is said here that is going to motivate both Adam and the woman, Adam and Eve, to believe this promise of salvation and be saved because of it. But we'll get into that next time. I'd like everyone please bow your heads. I'm going to ask you to do that because we're just talking about the first declaration of the gospel. Now I'm going to give you the gospel. As we know it today, over time, the gospel, we've, got, we've, got, we've received more and more information as the canon of scripture was completed. Now we know that the seed of the woman is Jesus Christ. He's the one that went to the cross. He was perfect, sinless. He died on the cross for you, for me, for all mankind. He was buried. But death could not hold him. He rose from the grave, victorious over death. And now he offers eternal life to anyone who will trust him and him alone for purchasing your freedom, for taking on your debt, for suffering in your place. And the greatest news is that you don't have to earn anything. You don't have to work for it. It's only given as a gift. For by grace are you saved through faith of that, not of yourself. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So this right now, at this moment, if you are an unbeliever, if you're not certain about your eternal destiny, you can believe in the Lord Jesus Christ's work on the cross rather than your own good works. And in that moment, you're born again. You're a child of God. Your ticket to heaven is guaranteed you possess God's own righteousness, and your future is phenomenal. In the meantime, we are to learn and grow to show honor and give glory to the great God of the universe. Now, Father, we pray that you will help us to learn from what we've gone over this morning, that we will stop making excuses that we will start taking responsibility for our actions, and that way we can be forgiven and we can learn from them. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.